Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So welcome back. As we discussed uh, in the uh, introduction, uh, our uh, module 1 will cover topics of uh, chemical thermodynamics. Okay, and here we will talk about, uh, we will basically review uh, some parts of classical thermodynamics. We will go into energy conservation and using energy conservation we will show how adiabatic flame temperature is can be obtained. And the material of this uh, uh, of this uh, talk or of this uh, lecture is mainly taken from uh, uh, combustion physics by C. K. Law, combustion by Glassman and also combustion and an introduction to thermo uh, by uh, and thermodynamics and an introduction to thermostatics by H. B. Callan. This is a very classic text in uh, uh, thermodynamics uh, which you might be aware of. So, why do we need to understand uh, chemical thermodynamics and combustion? Now, chemical thermodynamics deals with the description of equilibrium states of reacting multi-component systems. Now, as you would recognize, a combustion is essentially is deals with reacting multi-component systems. Of course, there is reactions and because of reaction you have heat release and of course, it is multi-component because you have fuel, you have oxidizer and you have different kinds of products right? and also might be intermediates. So, it is a study. Uh, so, to understand that uh, what are the equilibrium states of uh, combustion, we need to know chemical thermodynamics. Now, in a practical combustion process or in any process as such, most process as such, the reactions, the chemical reactions, especially combustion reactions cannot reach completion. Okay? Rather, the products of combustion will acquire the state of chemical equilibrium. Okay. So, to understand the composition and the temperature of the combustion products, okay, which is governed by chemical equilibrium, we need to understand chemical thermodynamics. Now, uh, now then you are want to ask okay, if uh, does uh, in the most uh, practical combustors is chemical equilibrium reached. Now, the target is to ensure that chemical equilibrium is reached. Okay. Now, we need to design combustors such that fuel and air have sufficient residence time to mix and react and attain thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay. But depending on the flow, on the speed of the flow, uh, thermodynamic equilibrium may or may not be reached. We will come to that. For example, in a gas turbine combustor, your residence times are large flow residence times. Flow residence times you can simply uh, uh, obtain by the length of the combustor divided by the uh, velocity of the of the fuel air mixture of the air flows speed that is uh, mean air flow speed that is inside the combustor. So, this you can uh, define as the residence time. Now, in a gas turbine combustor this is large. For example, in a scramjet combustor this can be very small because in a scramjet combustor your U is very very large. right? So, in a scramjet combustor you may not have thermodynamic equilibrium, in a gas turbine combustor you may or may not have thermodynamic equilibrium, okay. but the target is to uh, ensure that it is reached. Now, when you do a first cut design, an engineering design, you do not need to go into the different things like how a flame looks like inside a combustor, how the flame structure looks like, how does the flow look like when the first of course, those are needed for optimizing the combustor or the optimizing the engine, but for the first cut analysis you need to know what is the heat and the power output that you can obtain from the combustor. Okay. And that can be estimated by assuming thermodynamic equilibrium of the combustion products. So, that is why you in thermodynamic equilibrium or and um, chemical equilibrium is a very important tool that we must know uh, for combustion engineering. Okay. So, the basics of uh, combustion, the basics of the combustion engineering are discovered here. So, now 
practical reactants what should come what should undergo combustion and the product of what should be in chemical equilibrium fuels so what are the question is what are the fuels gaseous fuels can be hydrogen carbon monoxide methane ethane propane butane if it is greater than 5 if the number of carbons is greater than 5 typically they are liquid and in the previous introduction introductory lecture we have seen the importance of liquid fuels because of their very high energy densities okay and uh, then uh, we also have alcohols and for other purposes for power generation purpose we might have coal woods etc metals which is not of importance in this uh, course so fuels liquid fuels and gaseous fuels are of primary importance in this course which are mainly hydrocarbons now oxidizer now the great thing about the most important thing about air breathing combustion air breathing engines as such is that here of course you are carrying the fuel uh, in the fuel tank but the oxidizer you are taking from the air from the atmosphere so this has a great benefit that a you are not carrying the oxidizer with you which reduces the payload of the of uh, which 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 allows you to carry some other things and also you do not spend money to get the oxidizer okay it comes free so that is the hallmark of air breathing propulsion that a we are not carrying the oxidizer and it comes free from the atmosphere so we only have to spend money for the fuel only the fuel costs okay so how does uh, what is the composition of air we know that for every point uh, we know that air is composed of 21% volumes of oxygen and approximately 79% nitrogen and the rest are there are also some amount of small amount of uh, carbon dioxide and um, also uh, inert gases etc so for every we can write that for every 4.76 moles of air there is one mole of oxygen and there is 3.76 moles of nitrogen now please note this number 3.76 it essentially is uh, comes from uh, dividing 0 0.79 by 0 0.21 now this we will uh, use this number very often because uh, most likely because uh, as we the topic of the 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 the, mm, uh, the title of the this uh, course is air breathing uh, essentially combustion and air breathing engines so we will only deal with uh, hydrocarbon burning in air so we will frequently encounter this number of 3.76 moles of nitrogen so uh, let us consider the overall uh, combustion reaction of methane uh, in which uh, this is methane and this is oxygen and it produces 2 moles of uh, water and 1 mole of CO2 okay so uh, first we define something like an equivalence ratio equivalence ratio is the fuel to oxidizer ratio the actual fuel to oxidizer ratio divided by the stoichiometric fuel to oxidizer ratio which you probably already know now fuel lean of course if it is between 0 and 1 it is fuel lean and if it is between 1 and infinity it is fuel rich of course you see that this fuel lean and fuel rich definitions are not very uh, are not uh, do not occupy the equal ranges in uh, it do not occupy equal ranges so we can uh, also define a normalized equivalence ratio phi capital which is divided which is defined as phi divided by 1 plus phi and this gives a more symmetric uh, definition for fuel lean and fuel rich of course you must remember that uh, if it is this uh, with though we define phi from 0 to 1 this does not mean that combustion happens between uh, phi from 0 to 1 it only happens within certain range of phi and which will be later define as uh, flammability okay so now with this uh, we need to review uh, the concepts of uh, classical thermodynamics now let us go uh, slowly over this uh, it might appear a little bit new but this is important to introduce uh, uh, the, the classical thermodynamics in a in the in a slightly different manner and this is mainly taken from um, this uh, the the concepts are basically taken from this book Herbert B Callen uh, uh, thermodynamics and an introduction to thermostatics so what are the postulates there are basically four postulates and there can be several corollaries which will not go into that the postulate states that there exist particular states called equilibrium states which you might be aware of equilibrium states in thermodynamics here where basically all the motivation is to find out this equilibrium states and the characteristics of this equilibrium states so this says that there exist particular states called equilibrium states of simple compressible systems that macroscopically are characterized completely by the internal energy u 
this is internal energy u volume v and the mole of the particle numbers or mole numbers n 1 into n k that is if you have different species in your uh, system like methane, oxygen etcetera. So, the mole numbers of them of the chemical components. So, a state can be essentially characterized by the internal energy u, the volume v and the particles number or the mole number. Okay. Then it states that there exists a function called entropy s which is a function of these extensive parameters u, v and n. Now, you remember what are extensive parameters? Extensive parameters are those that depends on the size of the system right and if you say double the size of the system the magnitude of the parameters also gets doubled or if you triple the size of the system the magnitude of the parameters also get tripled. So, S is a function of these extensive parameters okay, of any composite system defined for all equilibrium states and having the following property. The values assumed by the extensive parameters in the absence of an internal constraints are those that maximize entropy for the composite isolated system. So, this says that these parameters, these extensive parameters u, v, n, i will act in a such a manner that your entropy is maximized in these equilibrium states. Okay. And the entropy of a composite system is additive, this is the third postulate that entropy of a composite system is additive over the constituents of systems. Moreover, the entropy is a continuous differentiable and monotonically increasing function of internal energy. And this is the fourth which is not really important now it is called the fourth uh, third law of thermodynamics that is uh, the entropy of any system vanishes in the state for which d partial d u d s v n equal to 0 at the 0 that is at the when temperature is equal to 0. This first three postulates are very important and we will use them to essentially review chemical thermodynamics. So, if you see if you go to this uh, second postulates it says that S is a function of u, v and n i. u is the internal energy, v is the volume and n i are the mole numbers. Right. So, we can also write the internal energy is a function of S, V and N i. If so, we can write d u is equal to partial d u d s d v over all species i is equal to 1 to n say there are total n species. Okay. So, this we can write. Now, we can define using this we can define certain uh, quantities that is we can say T is equal to temperature we define it as this way partial d u partial d s when v and n i is constant we can define p is equal to minus d u d v when s and n i are constant and we can define another new quantity called chemical potential which is defined as d partial d u partial d n i when s and v are constant. Okay. Now, uh, we can show that these definitions that we have defined actually corresponds to our known definitions of temperature, pressure and chemical potential. Using this you can show that, that if you define it like this, this quantity T will emerge as that quantity which will determine whether thermal equilibrium is attained. Okay. That this quantity T will determine when or when or in other words when this t, this quantity say T in two different uh, uh, components of a system which are separated by a non adiabatic wall when these two quantities are equal there will be no heat flow. 
Similarly, when this in that in, in two composite uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in a system which is uh, separated into two parts by a flexible wall which can move in these two components if this pressure P are equal then you will see that it can be shown that mechanical equilibrium is attained. Similarly, for chemical potential you will see that once again if you define if you have a composite system which is divided into two parts and if mu 1 and mu 2 are equal that is the chemical potential of the of the one system is equal to the chemical potential of the other systems and if these two systems are separated by a, a permeable wall then you will see that the matter flow will stop when chemical potential that is mu 1 equal to mu 2. So, temperature determines thermal equilibrium, pressure determines mechanical equilibrium and mu chemical potential determines whether matter will flow from one system to other system when they are separated by a permeable wall. So, this then corresponds it can be shown in this way. So, this then corresponds to our known definitions of temperature, pressure and chemical potential. We will not go into show how this can be uh, obtained actually. But now, we can even uh, define new quantities which is uh, enthalpy which is equal to U plus P V We can define Helmholtz free energy A is equal to U minus T s and we can define Gibbs free energy is equal to H minus T s. Okay. Now, this quantity is we will see that is very important for determining chemical equilibrium. Okay. Now, if you go to the third postulate. Uh, or the uh, let us go back yes if you go to the second postulate itself you have seen that this part says that the values of the extensive parameters in absence of an internal constraints are those that maximize the entropy for the composite isolated systems. Okay. So, we can write that means that the equilibrium criteria for a isolated system from the second postulate emerges as d s when u v n is equal to 0 and it can also be shown that the corresponding equilibrium criteria in terms of Gibbs free energy will be d g for T p n is equal to 0. Okay. Now, when T and uh, so what was the definition of uh, 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 so we defined that uh, we defined G is equal to H minus T s. So, what does this this mean actually? Okay. So, this means that so we can write and of course, we have defined that G is equal to H minus T s. So, we can define d g is equal to d h if you differentiate is equal to minus t d s minus s d t and that is, is equal to d u plus p d v that is if you differentiate h itself where h is equal to uh, is equal to u plus p v. Okay. Now, let us go back to what we defined u as we defined u as d u that is if you go to this thing this is d u is equal to uh, t d s uh, minus p d v plus summation i is equal to 1 to n mu i d a n i right. This is what we obtained that is this is if you substitute these things here, if you substitute these things here, if you substitute this thing here this is what you get. And now, if you substitute this thing into this what you get is T g is equal to T d s minus P d v plus summation 
i is equal to 1 to n mu i d n i plus p d v plus v d p minus t d s minus s d t. So, you see that p d v p d v cancels t d s t d s cancels and you are left with this, this and this. So, we define we can d g is equal to v d p minus s d t plus summation i is equal to 1 to n mu i d n i. Right? So, now if we apply the equilibrium criteria that is this onto this at t and p is equal to constant what we get is d g is equal to summation i is equal to 1 to n mu i d n i is equal to 0. Now, please remember this this is a very important thing. We will use this to arrive at more important concepts in, uh, in chemical thermodynamics. Okay. Now, let us again go back to the, uh, to the concept that uh, u itself is an extensive parameter. Okay. Now, as I said that it depends on the extensive means that it depends on the size of the system. So, if you double the size, it is uh, the magnitude of the parameter also gets doubled. So, mathematically what this means is that, that if you define u is equal to lambda s, lambda v, lambda n i, then we can write lambda u is equal to s v n i. Okay. Now, mathematically this means that these are first order homogeneous quantities. Extensiveness essentially implies that first order homogeneous. Now, we can then invoke Euler's theorem and we can go into a first order equation of the form if we write lambda x i y is equal to lambda x i which can be any uh, variable as such and l y is equal to lambda x i just like we have written we have written internal energy if we can write it for a general variable y dependent variable y and the general dependent variable uh, uh, x i we can if we write this just like we have written for internal energy and uh, then whose differential is given by d y is equal to summation i g i d x i then by Euler's theorem uh, y is given by summation i uh, g i x i. Okay. So, this is uh, what it uh, what it is. So, then it means that the, all the differentials that we have obtained for internal energy we can remove and obtain the function or the parameter itself. Okay. So, this we can allow us to simply remove all the differentials in uh, g etcetera uh, we can remove the differentials of internal energy and we can write it as internal energy as h u is equal to uh, T s it was essentially d u is equal to T d s minus P d v plus summation i mu i d n i. So, this so by these things by this Euler's theorem uh, we can write u is equal to T s minus P v plus summation i mu i n i. Okay. And now, we can use this to substitute in the in the Gibbs free energy. Okay. So, which is essentially g is equal to we know is equal to h minus T s is equal to u plus P v minus T s. So, we can substitute here this here and this implies g is equal to um, T s minus P v minus plus summation i is equal to mu i n i plus P v minus T s. So, this this cancels and this this cancels. So, this implies g is equal to summation i mu i just one second. Right. 
this implies g is equal to summation n i okay so then this becomes the definition of g now the reason why i have gone through all these things is that in many uh, books you will find that this is defined in a little bit convoluted manner and it's this comes arbitrarily now i myself could not understand these things and it took me some amount of time to understand how this is arrived from dg how you can arrive at uh, g is equal to summation mu y n i now these are very important and very fundamental concepts which we need to be which needs to be clarified okay now so we have obtained this and let's uh, erase these things so uh, now so we'll we'll uh, go back uh, we'll just have obtained two very important things that is for equilibrium we have obtained dg is equal to summation i mu i dni is equal to 0 and we have obtained the definition of g okay which is given by summation i mu i and i but remember the difference is that this is a differential this is the actual g parameter itself quantity itself okay so now uh, Let us uh, go and apply this to a, a real uh, a chemical reaction and see how we can what we can what property we can obtain for that um, uh, for the um, for that chemical reaction. So, in general um, you can say uh, suppose you are having a chemical reaction like H plus O2 going to OH plus O. Now, of course, you know that this is one chemical reaction which is very simple. So, this all the stoichiometric uh, coefficient this is 1, this is 1, this is 1, this is 1, right. Now, of course, there can be a numerous kinds of chemical reactions. So, we need to have a general representation and the general representation for this can be like something like uh, I can write uh, like uh, I can write a general reaction like y is equal to 1 to n nu i dash m i nu i dash is the stoichiometric coefficient for the reactant m i is the name of the species which goes to summation i is equal to 1 to n nu i dashed m i okay and this is the name of the product and this is the stoichiometric coefficient of the product now it goes to 1 to n in both sides so if you apply this to now this equation n is equal to then is 4 because in the total reaction we have four species hydrogen atom oxygen one hydroxyl radical and one oxygen right so uh, it has these things so that it is not confusing all right so uh, here uh, if you see that our new i dashed for h uh, if i write the name of the species and new i dashed and uh, new i double dash um, and this is say our m i Okay. So, for H we have nu i dash is equal to 1, nu i double dash is equal to 0 okay, because it does not appear on the products. So, we can say the stoichiometric coefficient of H in the product side is 0. For O2 we have 1, we have 0. For OH we have nu i dash is equal to 0 and for this is 1 and for O we have this is equal to 0, this is 1. So, this I hope explains you the uh, principle by which you are writing this generalized equation. Okay. Now this is just for a demonstration purpose, and uh, but this is uh, I mean the reason for introdu introducing this kind of notation is that this is uh, if you are suppose writing a uh, going to going to read a code um, uh, a commercial code or a research code and you are going to read the manual or going to read a uh, literature you will find that there this uh, you know, the, the the it is uh, the reactions are represented in this generalized manner and not really in the this manner so it is important to get familiar with the with the with the state of the art notations also okay so that is why i have introducing this kind of notations all right so now uh, say this is our generalized uh, reaction which we will use throughout this kind of uh, generalized reaction uh, notation and now uh, the now by element conservation we can say that we can write essentially dni divided by nu i double dash by nu i dash is equal to dnj divided by nu i nu j double dash by nu j dash and that we can represent by a progress variable lambda which is the reaction progress. So, for uh, uh, this d lambda amount of reaction progress this amount of uh, n i is uh, can be produced or consumed depending on the sign and uh, this is proportional to their stoichiometric coefficients. 
rather the change in the stoichiometric coefficients between the product side and the reactant side all right so uh, we can write d a 9 is equal to nu i double dash minus nu i dash uh, times d lambda okay so we can now substitute this here uh, so the condition of equilibrium becomes d g is equal to summation i uh, nu i double dash minus nu i dash times uh, mu i times d lambda. Now, d lambda does not depend on i, so that can go out. So, this is it. This is equal to 0 for equilibrium. Okay. Now, we will come back to this. Let us remember this and we will come back to this very soon. Now, let us consider a single ideal gas at constant temperature. Okay need not be in equilibrium. So, for that we can write d g is equal to v d p and for the i th pure component of the ideal gas we can write d mu i is equal to v by n i d p i. I will not derive how you do this and this is left as a, a little small exercise to you. So, you can check how you can basically go from mm, uh, uh, that uh, the for our system not in equilibrium how this can be arrived at. This is very simple just you take, have to take the differentials. Okay. Now, for an ideal gas we know that P we can know that uh, uh, P i V whereas, P i is essentially the partial pressure. Uh, of the gas is equal to n i times r t right. So, v by n i is equal to r t by p i. So, substituting this here we get d mu i is equal to r t d p i and now we can integrate on both sides from a given reference state from p i 0 we will actually define this reference state to be p i equal to 1 that is which can be like 1 bar and p i then this gives mu i t minus mu i 0 uh, t is equal to r t ln p i by p i 0. p i 0 is equal to we can say always 1, 1 bar or uh, and that is our this is equal to 1. Okay. So, the equation we have obtained is essentially mu i t or is or actually is also a function of pressure of course, as you see uh, because it depends on the reference pressure which is it has arrived. So, this is a function of pressure also. Okay. Fine. Now, uh, if we go back uh, to our definition of equilibrium, we have uh, already obtained d g is equal to d lambda summation i is equal to 1 to n mu i double dash minus mu i dash that is the difference of the stoichiometric coefficients from the product side to the reaction side mu i this is equal to 0. Now, of course, g lambda is arbitrary. So, we do not need it. So, this is the equation that we obtain. Now, what we can do is that 
we will basically substitute this thing here. Okay. So, if we do that we obtain summation i is equal to 1 to n we can take this part on the right hand side this is equal to because of the properties of the logarithm okay and this quantity is called the equilibrium constant kp in terms of pressure equilibrium constant in terms of pressure which is only a function of temperature. Why is it only a function of temperature? Because what you have on this side is essentially if you bring this down here So, if you take this here in the denominator. So, this is a function of temperature alone this is a function of temperature alone. So, this is L n k p can be only be a function of temperature alone. Okay. So, you must always remember that though it is k p it is only a function of temperature. Okay. So, uh, and uh, of course, you see what it is essentially it is a product of the different partial pressures raised to their stoichiometric uh, factors stoichiometric uh, proportionality. Uh, stoichiometric constants uh, for the given um, reaction. Okay. So, that is what uh, k p is and this is a very important tool to understand to estimate why, why we have got this. This is a very important quantity uh, which can be you can find in different kind of tables for a given reaction or for other things. Using the k p we can find out what is the composition of chemical equilibrium that is what is the combustion what is if you are interested in understanding what is the composition of the combustion products that is given by k p. So, that is why it is a very very important constant, but remember always that it is a function of temperature alone. Okay. So, uh, what we have obtained is that we have obtained this uh, thermodynamic function we have obtained this criteria for uh, chemical equilibrium mu i d n i here the overbar essentially represents when it is in terms of moles which we have also used. So, uh, we have obtained uh, the general expression for chemical reaction and by implementing applying ele element conservation we have obtained the criteria for chemical equilibrium to be this and we have obtained uh, derived the y chemical potential should be in this manner whereas, p 0 is 1 and then we have obtained the equilibrium constant k p which is given by this. So, this is what we have obtained and the final expression for k p as given here is this one. Okay. So, now as I said that you can uh, see it is uh, uh, written here that the k p can be at a given temperature uh, can be tabulated for a given reaction okay. uh, or alternatively uh, one can also uh, find uh, write uh, define an another equilibrium constant because uh, you can relate partial pressure and concentrations and with that you can define k c and uh, k p and k c are also related uh, in the following manner. 
and uh, also we will see later that uh, this can be utilized for estimating a rate constant of a backward reaction if a forward reaction is known. So, this has got multiple use. Now, uh, how do you obtain K p? You can obtain of course, uh, there are numerous kinds of uh, reactions that are possible. So, it is very difficult to uh, write down uh, the K p for um, each of them. So, uh, uh, the best idea is to uh, is to basically estimate it somehow. So, we can uh, write that we can state that that uh, the K p uh, uh, the K p uh, we can define a K p uh, for the formation reaction of each species. That is we can if you are concerned with the species M i which can be say like a CO 2 we can write the formation of CO 2 like formation of C plus O 2 goes to CO 2 and uh, and you can basically define the K p of that reaction itself that is the reaction of formation of the K p i and the purpose is basically to obtain is to basically uh, have a relationship of K p i 0 and uh, this chemical potential at the standard state and by substitution you can obtain the K p in this manner. Okay. So, uh, often you will find that the instead of the K p of the reactions, the K p of, of the formation of the species is given and then using these kinds of linear the K p 0 for the individual species, you can estimate the K p of a reaction involving those species. All right. So, this is how we can estimate the equilibrium constant. Now, why is it useful? What do you do with the K p? As I said, the K p is used for uh, 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 the K p is used for uh, basically identifying or finding out the composition for the products which are in chemical equilibrium. Now, for a hydrocarbon oxidation that is if you say methane oxidation C H 4 plus oxygen uh, uh, that goes to if this to methane burns in oxygen as well as in some amount of uh, nitrogen mm, and if we assume that the nitrogen is not uh, participating in the reaction. Okay. So, the main products that you will get is C O 2 uh, water uh, and if it is lean then you can have some leftover oxygen and if it is rich you do not have any leftover fuels, but you have basically CO carbon monoxide and hydrogen as uh, which are also some amount some kind of fuels essentially. So, you can use this to basically find out the equilibrium uh, the composition. Now, for fuel lean mixtures there is no problem actually. For fuel lean mixtures that is suppose it is uh, propane burning in air this is air right. So, for burning 1 mole of propane you need uh, 5 moles of air okay. and phi is essentially the, the equivalence ratio in front uh, which is uh, uh, something between 0 and 1 and uh, you will see that there will be for phi moles of uh, propane there will be 3 phi C 3 phi moles of CO2, there will be 4 phi moles of, moles of water and uh, you will have some leftover oxygen in this form and then this is constant because it does not participate in the reaction. So, this is predetermined, this is you do not need equilibrium, comp, uh, uh, equilibrium uh, 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 constants to find out the composition of CO2, water and oxygen because these are uniquely determined defined through element conservation that is just by looking at the reaction and by looking at how the 3 moles of uh, of uh, C the, the, the 3 molecules of C in the propane and H 8 mm, uh, th 3 atoms of C uh, and 8 atoms of H in propane how they are uh, uh, how it is uh, the, the formula for propane and the formula for oxygen and nitrogen etcetera. You can find out how many uh, what will be the proportionality constants for what will be the stoichiometric constants for CO 2 what will be the stoichiometric constants for water and uh, for oxygen and nitrogen so on and so forth. So, this is uniquely defined. The problem arises when you have rich mixtures or in other some cases when you actually include more species, then you cannot basically if you include more species in your equilibrium uh, in your inner products. Of course, there are these are not the only species that is produced that is at equilibrium in in, in uh, in a combustion reaction you can have some hydroxyl, you can have some um, um, 
uh, some CO, some trace amount of CO, etcetera, and many other molecules that are that will be formed. So, if you include more species, you will actually uh, cannot uh, determine the equilibrium composition through just this uh, elemental balance. And this problem is clearly identified here when you have fuel rich mixture, that is, when you burn. Uh, propane uh, in oxygen and when phi is greater than 1, then of course, you produce CO2, but you also produce CO, you also produce water, you also produce hydrogen and you also produce nitrogen. So, how do you know that how many moles will go to CO and how many moles, how many what will be the uh, how many what will be B and what will be A which are the stoichiometric uh, coefficients okay? and how many what will be C and what will be D. Now, by applying element conservation, we can basically form of by applying element conservation between C H and O, okay, which are the only elements which are participating in the reaction uh, through different molecules, uh, we can have three, three equations, but as you can see we have four unknowns. So, where will the other unknown come from? Okay. So, that for that we need an initial reaction that is a water gas shift reaction and for that we need to know the K p of that. Okay. So, using that the K p of that will be de de defined by this, uh, because uh, if you immediately apply the the, def, the de derivation of Kp that we have obtained in terms of the partial pressure raised to the stoichiometric coefficients uh, for this water gas shift reaction, you will immediately find that Kp is this form, and then you can find Bc B. You can find this will be a proportional to B times C times divided by A and D, and if you can get this from the table, you can get this uh, from the, this value from the table, and we can find the additional equation that was missing to derive the four unknowns. So, like this using K p you can find out uh, uh, the, um, uh, the equilibrium uh, composition, uh, the, the product uh, the equilibrium composition uh, of the products of combustion reactions. All right. So, this class ends here, next we will see how we can apply uh, energy conservation uh, to basically um, obtain the temperature of uh, the adiabatic flame temperature in, in uh, for a combustion reaction. Thank you.